Praise the Lord. Today we're going to read Psalm 114. And it says, When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of, a str of strange language, Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like lambs. What ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? Thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back. Ye mountains, that ye skipped like rams, and ye little hills like lambs. Tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock into a standing water, and flint into a fountain of waters. So verse number one again, it says, when Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language. The psalmist here speaks of what was history for the people of Israel to reflect upon their ancestry and the things that they had faced to become a nation of its own rather than under the power of Egypt which at that time was under a heavy burden of pressure, coercion, desperation, and wicked rule. Further, the psalmist lets us and Israel know that the people of Israel had their own language, as they probably knew, of course, which was different from what the Hebrews had spoken. In fact, the Pharaoh and possibly the Egyptians too declared that the people of Israel were named by possibly Pharaoh as Hebrews due to the fact that they had spoken Hebrew and the Egyptians did not. Thus, when Joseph was ruler and his brethren came to meet him, he at first had spoken to them with an interpreter because there was a distinction between the languages. Joseph had come to learn the language of Egypt while his brethren, and while they stayed in the promised land, and they had spoken Hebrew only, and they didn't learn the language of Egypt. Hallelujah. Thus, when Israel, which became the name of the country to they when they were coming out of Egypt the separation was made between the Egyptians and Israel as nations so Israel became its own nation no longer under Egypt and also their languages which had already made a separation between peoples became more prominent for the Hebrews must have learned that the Egyptian language, while they were in Egypt, but from then on there was no need or probably no desire either, frankly speaking, to have them learn the Egyptian language. Maybe later, when they were going to do trade with Egypt as a nation, they would have certain people learn the language. But for the Israelites as a whole, as they journeyed in the wilderness and began forgetting Egypt, per se, at least in part, they were also forgetting the language of Egypt. However, they did remember the things that they had eaten while they were in Egypt. And that's what had uh, made things a little difficult for them because they really wanted to go and return to their former eating habits. Howbeit, one notes that when hard times came upon them, again, as I just mentioned, they remembered the food that they had in Egypt. Yet, they, they should really have remembered the promise that God had given them in uh, for the promised land. That was look forward to that and that it was a land of 
milk, and honey. Hallelujah. That's the promise that they had. And so they should have looked forward instead of backward. And that is um, looking back in the time that they lived in Egypt under slavery, under that burden. They didn't remember the, the hardships of the uh, beatings and all of that. And that's what they should have remembered. And just coming on to uh, remember that God had promised them good food, a land of milk and honey in the promised land. Here, the psalmist points out the language of Egypt to them by that time was a strange language. That is, by the time the psalmist started to write, it was strange. No longer did any Israelites or maybe a few uh, that were going to do trade with Egypt. They knew it, but it was a strange language for most of them. And so the people of Israel did not speak it and they did not know it. It was a foreign language, a strange language. It was by that time, obviously, a foreign language to them, which the psalmist had declared. He declared it as a strange language, a language which was not known to them. Thus, the house of Jacob was no longer within the country of Egypt, nor speaking their language, and it had become foreign to them. And the food was no longer eaten from Egypt by the time that they were in Israel, and they were under the writings of the psalmists. <laughs> they were no longer eating Egyptian food either. So there had gone, they had gone through a lot of changes. Amen. When one becomes a Christian, it is similar to one coming out of sin and learning to speak differently, to speak as a Christian. And um, per se, the food is no longer like that of Egypt, but it is, we focus in on spiritual food, like we hear the message of God being preached. We also take time to read the word of God. Amen. In verse number two, it says, Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. Here it states very clearly, Judah was his sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? A sanctuary is a sacred place of worship. And today, they would say that the uh, sanctuary is a place inside of a church building where they sit and they begin to sing and praise God and listen to the word of God. For the Israelites, that is where they had kept the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, so it was uh, in the temple, and the temple of Jerusalem, and the place in the temple there was a place called the Holy Place, and there was a place called the Holy of Holies as well. And it was a place that probably every Israelite went to worship on a regular yearly basis, at least, giving sacrifices and so on. And so it says, Israel, his dominion, means that that is where God had governed, had ruled at least when the Israelites were listening to and obeying God. Thus, during the times that Israel was serving God, God ruled in Israel. Today, according to the New, New Covenant, those who follow Christ, there are many places that one could say, there's the sanctuary of the Lord. It's a dedicated place for worship of the Lord, and that worship actually can take place inside of a church building. But for the early Christians, let's take a look at that. In all reality, they had to, or they were, some, some of them were those who went to the synagogue, and then they began hearing about Christianity. Some of them became Christians. And I believe that they still continued for some time going to the synagogues. But then there was a change made that they be decided 
you know, to worship together as Christians. And, <clears throat> and uh, so the temple also was a place where the Jews had gone and uh, they worshiped there. But as Christians, some of them might have been kicked out of the synagogue, might have been kicked out of the temple. And, uh, and then, of course, we have to realize that there is a difference when in the synagogue they were not worshiping uh, Jesus Christ. Um, and the Christians had come to that realization that they should focus their attention on and worship Jesus Christ. So, um, although that some were synagogue goers, then later on, they began to congregate in Christian worship services. And so uh, these were not called synagogues anymore. They began later on to build, of course, churches, but they started out going to people's homes, and that's where they had worshipped God. So the sanctuary would not be per se just one fixed location. It could be anywhere where people come together. I mean, um, the word says that where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus speaking, there am I in the midst of them. Kind of like one could say that is a focused time of uh, singing praising and worshiping Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if it's two or three and uh, possibly during the time of persecutions, which Jesus knew that they would suffer persecution. So he, he wanted to comfort his people by saying that, that is, you know, two or three gathered in his name, he's in the midst. So worshiping Jesus Christ, one can worship him in that manner and knowing that God is there. Jesus Christ is there. Hallelujah. So some had continued in the synagogues and the temple, but possibly later on they were rejected. They were cast out. And then further on, they began to worship in homes. And Paul, he had gone to synagogues to preach about Jesus, testify who he was. When they did not accept the message, and then he kind of like uh, shook off, his, you know, his his the duft off his feet or something, and then he would go to another place, and sometimes it was in a home, and he would preach Christianity there. Christians overall later on, moved away from and out of the synagogues and the temple and started to worship Jesus Christ in their own homes or homes of other people. Moreover, when persecution had arisen um, because they were Christians, they were to still continue to worship. But sometimes they had to make it a secret where they were worshiping. Amen. So the sanctuary is, we could say, a place where the worship goes on, whether it be in a home, in a building, or any other place. Sometimes it's even outdoors or wherever. Hallelujah. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. That's verse number three. Just as much then as Judah being the sanctuary and Israel, the dominion. When the Israelites had come out of Egypt, the sea rolled back and fled as it states. Hallelujah. That is, even though Israel had not been in the promised land yet, Israel was from that time on during the Old Testament hallelujah, and should have been the dominion of God, that is God ruling them, hallelujah. Therefore, the place of worship, per se, was not a distinct location at that time, for they were on their way to the promised land. However, when they had walked on dry ground and came out the other side, uh, 
talking about the Red Sea and Jordan. Alleluia. The in, in referring to the Red Sea, the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea. The Israelites, we could say, were saved. And they began to sing and worship freely as though it were there, right there, that the sanctuary was, for they were worshiping God, and the dominion was in the place. God's dominion was in the place wherever they were, and they were subject to him. In addition, uh, the Jordan River, um, in one verse, it mentions the Red Sea and the Jordan River, both of these that were held back and were made to allow the Israelites to pass over. As we know, Joshua and Caleb uh, were the only two adults that were over the age of 20, uh, going from all the way from Egypt all the way into the Promised Land. Uh, but yet there were children that were younger than or even we could say teenagers that were younger than the age of 20 that came from Egypt all the way into the promised land. So the ages of those over 20 and upon leaving Egypt and entering the wilderness, there were only two that made it all the way to the promised land. But then there were children or teenagers during those times under the age of 20 who could have made it all the way. But we, of course, we have not the number. Hallelujah. And so the Red Sea and the Jordan River, when uh, the Israelites had passed, they passed through and they passed through on dry ground because the power of God had moved back the Jordan River and the Red Sea. Hallelujah. So the children of Israel came out the other side and they were, of course, safe. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Verse 4 and 5 says, The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like lambs. What ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest, thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back? Now, of course, here in the verse number four, that particular verse, uh, I wanted to uh, study it a little bit more, so I did verse five first. <laughs> and so it says, what is so keenly interesting is the wording of the psalmist, mentioning about the Red Sea and the Jordan River as why it had fled. You know, when we talk about fleeing, it's usually meaning that one is kind of leaving because there is something you know, maybe uh, that one wants to get out of the way. I mean, run quickly. And uh, so why was it driven back? The truth is the people of God in, in, in the Old Testament, the Israelites, um, the nation that had that God had selected at that time were the people of Israel, and they were passing through um, as a nation, getting out of Egypt, coming into their promised land. Therefore, the Red Sea and the Jordan River had no power to stop them from entering in together, for it was in God's will that it take place and happen just as it was God ordered. In the first part, there is a comparison to a skipping ram for mountains and skipping lambs for hills. The question would be, why is it that the mountains and hills skipped in the first place? Or it was like, uh, like a skipping lamb they skipped like lambs they skipped like uh skipped like rams they skipped like uh lambs amen glory to Dios. or why is the writer why has the writer mentioned that the hills and the mountains were skipping what has that got to do with israel since mountains are bigger than hills it names a ram which is a male sheep, for a ram is full grown. Thus the hills are considered lambs to mountains. The hills are considered lambs, and the rams uh, were considered 
the mountains. However, when one reads the skipping part, one begins contemplating about the skipping of both the rams and the lambs. To me, it sounds as though the psalmist had been had seen this action plenty of times in order to use it as an illustration. Thus, he observed it pl plenty of time, plenty of times, and must have thought that they had skipped or using that expression of a, a time of happiness and joy for the rams and for the lambs. To skip, according to Mary, Miriam Webster's third new international dictionary on a bridge, it means to move with leaps and bounds, or even to leap over lightly and with agility. And in seeing many, as the psalmist must have, it reminded him at that moment, and he became inspired to write it, that the mountains and the hills had skipped. But at what moment? What moment was it that the mountains and the hills skipped? He was referring to, obviously here, the sea and the river moving back or fleeing when the Israelites had come through. Therefore, it follows that as Israel was passing through the wilderness, it must have been that, that thought also that the psalmist mentioned that the mountains and the hills had skipped like as though it referred to their enjoyment in seeing the Israelites pass, or that the presence of God was there. For it must have been the same enjoyment that the rams and the, uh, the lambs experience. They skip or they leap in excitement. Amen. Hallelujah. And then Romans chapter 8 and verse number 18 says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And you note that um, when the Israelites or the Hebrews were in Egypt, they were suffering under the um, under the hardship of that the Egyptians had given them. But yet when they came out, then all of a sudden, here we have the Red Sea moving back, Jordan moving back, the mountains and the hills skipping. It's like here you can see the glory of God um, uh, coming down to give instruction to the Israelites. And even uh, he provided for them you know, water from the mountain, the rock. In Romans chapter 8, 21 to 23, it says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. When the Israelites had seen the dead bodies of the Egyptians in the Red Sea, and that they would no longer threaten them, they were overjoyed and had begun to sing praises unto God. Their free worship towards God began at that moment together as a nation. The Red Sea had opened up for them, but it also closed in on the Egyptian army. The same sea that allowed for the Israelites to pass because of the power of God, because the same sea that closed in on the Egyptians, and that caused their death. The skipping or leaping of the mountains and hills, no doubt with the idea of the rams and the lambs leaping, it signifies, or could signify, a joy for the presence of God was coming with the Israelites as they journeyed in the wilderness. When the Lord's presence came to the mountain top, the mountain trembled at the presence of the Lord. In like manner, there may have been many people have had 
the presence of the Lord come upon them and their body had trembled in one way or another. But it also brought joy to the people with much leaping or skipping. <laughs> Any time that the presence of God enters a room, a place, a person, there is joy or there is a re reaction. Of course, one knows that at Pentecost, the Spirit of God entered those who were in the upper room. Then it was the fact that they had received the Holy Spirit. Amen. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit had given them the utterance. The mountains and hills must have had that experience of the presence of God moving with the Israelites across the wilderness. Therefore, the Israelites, in worshiping God freely for the first time, would also be excited for that fact that God was with them. Verse number 6 and 7 says, Ye mountains that ye skipped like rams, and ye little hills like lambs, tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Amen. No doubt anything that has the presence of God come upon it, and especially, well, it can happen at the beginning and at the first time, but also even again and again, when God's presence comes, there can be joy, there can be a trembling, there, there can be, you know, such a different reaction or the same reaction of trembling hallelujah enjoying the presence of god and verse number eight says which turned the rock into a standing water the flint into a fountain of waters and then, and then came the waters there's the fact that the water had also that the rock had also water flowing out of it too because god helped the Israelites. Creation itself made way for the Israelites to be helped. But that same creation that uh, was benefit for the Israelites was a destruction for the Egyptians. May God bless you today in Jesus' name.